Hello everyone and welcome to my General Hospital official channel. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day. Before we begin, please hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. General Hospital gave us an unexpected kiss this week, which caught us off guard. Good news as well, the Port Charles gang has successfully left Africa. The unfavorable report? It appears that Africa will visit Port Charles. There was still no sign of Kevin or Laura as the race to save Lucky, which as I mentioned last week, is a completely uninteresting plot, proceeded. They must be lost somewhere in the Central African jungles after taking a wrong turn. On fact, on the Friday episode, Anna told Lucky about them at last. Then, with everyone's lives on the line, Sidwell forced Jason and Lucky to play a lethal game of cards, compelling Jason and Anna to confront their own mortality. What then did they do? They had a kiss. I'm going to venture a guess that most of the viewers did not want or even want Jason and Anna. However, please leave a remark below if you're here for it. Many others saw right away that the kiss was meant to divert the attention of the approaching guards. Still, the guess proved to be incorrect. It truly was a kiss. What then are the implications of this in the future? Although Robin's ex-boyfriend Jason, they remain close friends. Furthermore, Jason's commitment to Sonny may be put to the test by this relationship with Anna. And what about Valentine, naturally? We are aware that he will be on TV again eventually, but what does this signify for him and Anna? Oh, and I think we should call Jason and Anna Anna son if they end up dating. To me, that just seems like some kind of horrible drug or fungus. The actual action in Africa began on Friday's episode, after weeks of poker games, when Brennan sent in drones to blow up Sidwell's compound, freeing the Port Charles gang. Africa seemed to be behind us, but Holly's avarice in stealing Sidwell's gem seems to have driven him to chase her and the others back to Port Charles. Really? This narrative arc has been a complete failure, Sidwell should have been destroyed and the others should have made their getaway. We now have to put up with this madman for longer. A lot of viewers have already joined the Alexis and Martin squad. Martin is probably going to avoid Alexis' kiss of death with men these days, because this is Michael E. Knight, after all, and he might even end up being the one for her. I adored how quickly he suggested they save Alexis by throwing Sonny, the guy paying his bill, under the bus. But really, if it comes down to it, are Sonny, Michael, and Carly willing to let Alexis fry? Sam and Carly had a fantastic confrontation, but Carly offered the same old justifications, saying Alexis was a clever enough person to figure out a way out of this. It appears that they are once again at odds. Well, for the time that Sam has left, anyway. I'm still speculating that she's going to go for that pistol and die, which will leave a lot of people feeling guilty because many of them could have saved her life. And I can't help but wonder, WWJD? By the way, that's what will Jason do? Though Alexis has never been fond of him, will his allegiance to Sonny enable him to sentence his child's grandmother to prison or, worse, death row? I'm annoyed by everyone defending Sonny when the life of an innocent woman is in jeopardy, and not in the this is great soap opera kind of manner. Never before have I wanted Sonny to be imprisoned as much as I do now. In addition, he has a long criminal record. At last, Tiny James told Ned about the kiss between Drew and Willow. Was that a spontaneous chat, or what? To be honest, I had completely forgotten that James had witnessed the kiss, possibly because I'd like to forget about Drew and Willow altogether. But before getting too excited, those who assumed this implies they'll be revealed should hold off. This is Ned, and he will probably use his connections to threaten Drew into supporting him in his bid to become ELQ's CEO. Also, since they haven't had sex yet, which we all know will happen, their secret is not going to be revealed at this time. Because Stella won't put up with any of Tracy's BS, their friendship is a magical match. She confronts her and doesn't hesitate to correct her. Another example of Tracy's bad timing came when she visited Cody and Sasha to apologize, once again, the relationship was shattered in the heat of desire. Tracy apologized to them and then advised them to find a room with a locked door, which made me very happy. For real, this is the fourth time that these two have been disturbed, they really ought to check into the Metro Court. However, I have no doubt that Carly or Olivia will find a way to confront them there. 
there has been a lot of hinting that Irene slash Adela's passing would be the final straw for Molly and TJ. As he revealed to Stella, TJ is now enraged and resentful of Molly once more. To be honest, I'm annoyed that this plot is getting so much screen time. In order to keep Heather imprisoned in Pentonville, Portia did alter her tests. As some viewers have noted, she'll undoubtedly blame Brad for this, but I can't wait for General Hospital to bring down the powerful Portia. Terry, Chief of Staff, sounds good. Elizabeth abruptly announced that her brother Stephen was in Arizona, away from Heather, having finally been released from prison. That implies that Stephen will arrive in Port Charles before year's end, maybe serving as the unexpected cliffhanger for New Year's Eve in 2025. Roger Howarth will now take over as Stephen Weber. The fact that Chase's investigation into Kate's murder is straining their bond with Dante bothers me. Martin was gone for so long that it looks like he lost both his facial hair and his accent. Natalia told Sonny about her background, which is full of incidents that have turned off possible suitors. It's fortunate that Sonny differs from most others. Put that away. Why does it seem like Natalia, a character that so many people detest, is about to have a significant plot twist? Only if it miraculously reunites Allison and Blaze would I accept it. That concludes my reflections, assessments, and forecasts for this week. As usual, go to those comments and leave me a note. Stella gives Tracy some advice today on General Hospital, Willow begs Drew to avoid her, and Lucky finds out that Lulu requires a kidney donation. Tracy enters the Quartermain stables just as Cody and Sasha are getting flirtatious. Sasha maintains that she shocked Cody, despite Cody telling Tracy that she is only here because he invited her. Tracy advises them to keep quiet and never make any admissions until they are certain of the accusations made against them. Cody threatens to leave with Tracy if she fires Sasha. He assumes that since he will miss her, she will miss him as well. Tracy acknowledges that she would miss him, but she won't fire Sasha since Monica won't let it. Not to mention, her pastries are the best outside of Paris. Tracy came to report she was told to think again about her behavior after overreacting to their family brunch. Cody is perplexed and wonders what's wrong with her. Tracy claims that having to constantly disagree with her family is a cost of being the one with common sense. She says that she was taken aback to see Cody so content with his family. She apologizes, she just realized that her reaction was incorrect. She adds that they make a beautiful couple. Today on The Young and Restless Sharon reflects on her life and decisions as she battles to deal with Heather's death. In the dark, Sharon comes at a parquet and takes a seat on the bench. She recalls disposing of Heather's body and exclaims, How did this happen? How will I ever get out of this? Sharon tells herself she shouldn't have gone to Daniel's. How did I for one minute think it would bring healing, that it would bring justice, for you? She turns to Cassie's grave. She informs her daughter that she has always been her guiding light. Please help me comprehend how I did what I did. Help me figure out what to do. Sharon claims that what occurred tonight is not her. Is this the pinnacle of her life? Have I always been like this? She flashes back to her mother, Dolores, telling her that she ended up in a wheelchair because she pursued her on a wet night, believing she was about to do something she would regret with Frank. Sharon says on Cassie's grave, maybe I've always been plagued by guilt, a lifetime of things I wish I'd done differently. Something brought her there tonight. Perhaps to remind her that she has also accomplished nice things in her life. You are proof of that. She recalls meeting Nick and falling in love. No one ever made me feel more loved or protected. Sharon then recalls how not everyone was pleased they were together. She recalls Nikki's anger toward her in the beginning, as well as later in life. She recalls pouring a pitcher of milk over Nikki's head and wonders Cassie, have I always caused conflict? Is this who I am? Is that what got me here? Sitting on the ground in front of Cassie's gravesite, Sharon tells her late daughter that she and Nick were always able to reconcile. She recalls them reconciling after he left her for Phyllis. Their friendship remained strong even when they weren't together, despite being tested over time. Sharon recalls Nick claiming that she lied to him about her virginity after telling him she had given up a kid for adoption. She recalls, I was terrified he'd run, yet he stayed. 
he remained right at my side. You were the baby that I had to give up. Having you back was like a dream come true. She has a flashback about Nick adopting Cassie. She finally had all she wanted. I should have known that it wouldn't last. Sharon tells Cassie she didn't bring fresh flowers because I didn't know I was coming. But she's got something better. She displays a photo of herself, Cassie, and Nick, describing them as the ideal family. Sharon recalls Cassie becoming a Newman and laments, I didn't know how lucky we were until that horrible night. She recalls a teenage Cassie pleading with her and Nick to be permitted to attend the party. Sharon wishes she had put her foot down and not let her go out that night. It broke me, she says with tears. It broke Nick, and our marriage fell apart. Even afterward, she was constantly on the cusp of another downward spiral. Sharon recalls shoplifting, partying, and burning down the Newman Ranch. I was in the deep throes of bipolar disorder, and I didn't even know it. Cassie's death was always looming over her. Everything that transpired was a result of that awful night. Sharon sets a family photograph on the stone. She tears, I know exactly what you'd say. There were good times, too. Moments that kept the hope alive. She remembers when she was pregnant with Faith and Nick, and Cassie assured them they'd have another kid one day. She claims Faith is the daughter she predicted they would have. And then another miracle happened. Sharon recalls Mariah's entrance when she thought she was seeing Cassie. She assumed her head was playing tricks on her, but Nick discovered the reality. It was like I got you back, only it wasn't you. She recalls yelling at Mariah for gaslighting her. I was really irritated. How could someone who looks and sounds so similar to you not be you? Her heart refused to allow my intellect accept it. She recalls Nick telling her she had twins, and both she and Nick told Mariah she was her daughter. Sharon tears, wishing she could be the mother she never was to Cassie. Now, have I failed you both again? Sharon informs Cassie that Mariah resisted her at every turn, but she knew Cassie would want her to persevere, so she did. She recalls the first time Mariah phoned her mother. After that, things became simpler, and I came to appreciate Mariah for who she is, a special and unique person. Mariah is your twin, which means she carries a piece of herself for me to adore and cherish. For that, I will be eternally grateful. Being a mother to Faith, Mariah, and Noah has helped her move ahead. She's had some success. My life exceeded my expectations. She recalls buying crimson lights with Nick, Neil offering her a position at Jabot, and graduating from college. I do have something inside of me that has helped me keep going. It has helped her confront numerous problems. Sharon remembers unpleasant experiences, such as Matt Clark raping her and Ray dying. I'm a survivor, and no one could ever say that I never loved my children with my whole heart. She is proud to honor Cassie with Cassidy first, but she had no clue it would elicit such strong emotions from her. When I heard that Daniel had moved back to Genoa City, I thought so many years had passed that I could handle it. She wasn't expecting the wrath, which took over and made her want to hurt him. And I almost did. Sharon informs Cassie that she did not injure Daniel. She regained her composure, but Heather intervened. They battled, and she died, but she can't remember how. Sharon, pacing, claims she must have blacked out. Being unable to recollect makes her feel isolated and numb. That is why she is there, asking Cassie what to do. Should I just turn myself in? Confess my crime and put an end to this madness? She hopes her family will forgive her when they learn what she has done. They are her last remaining source of pure delight. My kids are the finest part of me. Proof that I perform certain things correctly. I am not all evil. Thank you. I know what to do now. She kisses her hand, touches the gravestone, stands up, and walks out the parquet. Faith leaves another concerned voicemail for her mother at Sharon's home. Mariah emerges from the kitchen with lunch, and Nick says he must go outside and attempt to find her. He wants them to stay in case she turns up. Faith worries that it is her fault. Mariah feels horrible for calling her out for lying. Sharon enters just then. 
Faith and Mariah question if she was attempting to scare them to death before hugging her. Nick asks Sharon, are you okay? Where have you been? Sharon tells them she is fine and that everything will be fine. We know something horrible is going to happen on the young and the restless. If we had to guess, something so horrific and devastating would kill someone. What happens next could be even more surprising. As we've already seen, Sharon, off her bipolar medication and fueled by her subconscious manifestation of longtime tormentor Cameron, has succumbed to the grief and rage she still feels over daughter Cassie's untimely death? To the point of poisoning the whiskey at Daniel and Heather's house. Furthermore, Heather caught Sharon leaving. Next, a series of shocking events will further connect Sharon to Daniel's family, including Phyllis, executive producer and head writer Josh Griffith told Soap Opera Digest. Thanks for watching if you like this video, so please don't forget to subscribe my channel and don't miss any update.